What's up guys? Happy New Year to everybody. Today we're going to do a new video and we're going to learn how to use player missile graphics in assembly language. I know that's something that a lot of you have been waiting to see, but we've been working in basic to try and get the concepts down. And now we're going to actually put it to use in some assembly language. We're going to move a spaceship on the screen and we're also going to use the joystick to move the spaceship. So with that being said, this is uh, the first of um, the tutorials and using sprites and player missile graphics on the Atari in assembly language. And as the series gets more mature, we're gonna be adding some backgrounds and some enemies. We're gonna fire missiles, we're gonna keep score. Uh, we're gonna do some really cool stuff. So um, I think you guys are gonna enjoy this series and we're also gonna get into some advanced topics, topics like display lists. Um, display lists are very powerful uh, instructions that can tell the antic chip how to break the screen up into different regions. In other words, you could have text and graphics and you know multiple layers of graphics and different lines of graphics all together. And uh, it's gonna be pretty cool. We're gonna be doing some pretty advanced stuff in uh, assembly language on the Atari. So um, for those of you that have always aspired to write a game on the Atari or to do some kind of a demo on the Atari, um, this is going to be the basis of what's going to be you're going to, what you're going to use to get to that point where you can do that. So um, anyway, I hope you like the video. Happy New Year to everybody! Shout out to all my subscribers. Don't go anywhere. All right, guys. So today we're going to be working with the Atari 800XL. I've got my Sparta DOS uh, cartridge. And I also have my Mac 65 with DDT cartridge, and this is going to be the development environment that we're going to be using for today's tutorial on how to do sprites in assembly language. So I've got some code already prepared. So let's go ahead and load that code up into the, the editor, the Mac 65 editor. And I'm actually loading it for my 1050 disk drive today. And what we're going to do is let's go ahead and take a look at this, this code. And you can see that it's voluminous. There's a lot of code here to do just this simple sprite example that we're gonna to do today. But there's a lot of setup code in here that um, you only have to do one time. So um, let's go ahead and assemble this with our assemble command. I want you to see actually what this sprite demonstration does today before we actually talk about the code. So we're assembling into memory location 5000. And once we get this assembled into memory, we'll go into the debugger and we'll execute the code so we can actually see what's, what's gonna happen. So there we go, we're compiled, we're assembled. Let's go into DDT and let's set our program counter to 5000. Now, as you can see, there's no valid instruction at location 5000. That's because within the code, I actually have some memory set aside before we actually do our first instruction for the screen device and some other memory locations that I've set aside for storing X and Y positions of our, our sprite. So be careful in assuming that your program is gonna start executing at the location that you're compiling at. Um, this program is actually starting at location 5000B, which is a load accumulator command. So let's go ahead and set our program counter to 5000B. All right, let's go ahead and execute our code. Now, if you guys are new to this channel and you have not seen my videos on how to use the Mac 65 with DDT um, assembly language editor and compiler and debugger, I highly recommend you click the link that I'm gonna put up top now. It'll also be in the description to learn how to use this editor, this assembler, um, before you get into some of these tutorials. Also, I've got several videos on my YouTube channel that talk about the basics of assembly language and using assembly language on the Atari. But with that being said, let's go ahead and execute this program at 5000B, and you'll see that we've cleared the screen. We've got a black screen with a purple spaceship in the middle, and I have my monster joystick here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move the joystick left and right, and you can see that I'm actually controlling my spaceship horizontally and it all, it goes to the right, stopping at the right extent, and it goes all to the, to the left, stopping at the left extent. And you can see how fast this, this spaceship is actually moving back and forth across the screen. Now, I want you to know that it's moving this fast, even with an included delay that I have within the code, which you'll see later on, 
Um, without that delay, the spaceship would move back and forth so fast that you would hardly be able to see it. That's the power of assembly language. All right, so this is what we're shooting for in this example. We, we, we want to get a, a sprite on the screen. We want to clear the screen. We want to take the Atari into a graphics mode five, and we want to be able to control the spaceship with the joystick going back and forth. All right, so let's hit reset. Let's hit Q to get out of the debugger, and let's take our first look at the code. Line 10 is pretty self-explanatory. I always like to have the first line number in my assembly language code as a command that will save the source code to the disk. And I like using the, um, the first line uh, because I can come in here and I can remove the, the line number and the comment and then press enter. And I know that I'm saving my source code to the same file name consistently every time that I need to save it. I don't have to worry about what did I call the code, you know, what did I aim it? I have it right here at the top of the listing. Then we've got some additional comments and then our line 40 is our required directive that tells the Mac assembler that we want to produce object code. And line number 50 is our, our starting base memory address for our object code. Now starting in line 60, we've got what we call our CIO equates, our central input output um, memory locations, if you will. And we talked about this in a prior um, video. If you haven't seen that video, I highly recommend you go watch that video, which talks about the input-output control block system in the Atari, which controls all of the input-output in a standard way on the Atari 8-bit computer. So lines 70 through, I want to say 190, 70 through 210, actually, we're setting up the memory locations and the names of those memory locations that we're calling them to access the central input output system. And we're gonna use that central input output system to set up our graphics mode and to clear the screen. It really doesn't have anything to do with player missile graphics or sprites, it's just we're using that to get the screen into the mode that we want. So now we're gonna go down and look at line number um, 220 through 330. These are some other memory locations that we need. For example, Y location, Y lock, I'm putting that into CC and that's gonna track our um, Y location for our sprite. Similarly, X lock is in CE and that's gonna control the X location, X position of our, our sprite. PM base is gonna be set to D0 and D1. This is gonna store the uh, base address where in memory we're gonna set up our player missile graphics. Uh, stow top, that's going to be a temporary location that I'm going to use to keep the old top of RAM, which ironically is going to be the new, ba the new bottom of the PM base. Stick zero is going to be referencing memory location D300, which is the joystick zero position. Okay, you can read D300 at any time and get the joystick zero position um, in order to, re to be able to read that and H pause P0, I am setting to D000, and that is a location in the player missile graphics system that will give us the current, hor or set the current horizontal position of player zero. Line 290, I'm setting up uh, an equate or a name uh, called S name. It's a byte string, and that's gonna, equi that's gonna equal S colon with an end of line, 9B, and this is what we call the screen device. This is what we're gonna to use to um, tell the central input output system that we're working with the screen device. Line 300 is set up um, as a name player, and this is a byte stream that is gonna hold the bitmap data for our spaceship, our player zero. And as you remember from um, our basic lessons on player missile graphics, we use, um, uh, bitmaps to define our players or our sprites, if you will. And the only thing we need to do is design that bitmap data using a seven bit, uh, a seven bit wide um, bit field and extrapolate the binary or the decimal numbers needed to define the lines of the bitmap and then use those values in uh, a data statement in basic or in a byte stream here in assembly. So this 2460, 126, 102, 126, et cetera, is basically building player zero. All right, so let's look at lines number 310 and on. This is where we are going to set aside the top of RAM like we did in basic 
for our player missile graphics. Now, as you remember, when you're working with player missile graphics in the Atari system, you have to set aside a block of memory and tell the Atari this block of memory, 1K or 2K, depending on if you're using single line or double line resolution graphics, um, is going to be used for player missile graphics. So, the first thing we need to do is we need to get the top of RAM and we do that by looking into location 106. So we're gonna load the accumulator with what's in location 106, which if you look in your Atari, mapping the Atari manual, 106 returns to you the top of RAM. We're immediately gonna store that top of RAM into our memory location stow top, and we're gonna use that later on, I'll show you. Now that we have the top of RAM, we need to subtract a certain number of pages from that top of RAM and allocate that area for our player missile graphics. So we are going to do some subtraction and as you know, when you're gonna do subtraction in assembly language, the first thing you need to do is you set the carry flag. And then we're gonna do an SBC, which is a subtraction. And we're gonna take number, we're gonna take four off of the value we had in the accumulator. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna basically back our value up by four, which we know really equates to four pages of memory. Pages in the Atari are 256 bytes a piece. So what we did was we took the value of 106, we're backing it up by 104, which is really, in a sense, um, subtracting 1K off the top of RAM, okay? And then we're gonna turn around and we're gonna store that value right back into 106, thus telling the Atari, guess what? Your top of RAM is now 1K less than what it was before, okay? We're also gonna store that value into location 54279 because we have to tell the Atari player missile graphic subsystem, this is where the base, if you will, of the player missile graphics starts. Our new top is actually our player missile graphics base, okay? I'm also gonna keep this value around inside a memory location I created called PM base because we're gonna use it a little bit later on to set up our players and our missiles. So I'm gonna store that high byte, low byte into PM base plus one, which is the high byte, and then we're gonna load a zero, and we're gonna store that into PM base, which is the low byte. All right, so high byte, low byte, we're keeping around, we're sticking around, or we're keeping around the, uh, the new top of RAM that we set, which is our player missile graphics base. Okay, so we got, now we've got the, the, the area set aside in memory for our player missile graphics. So let's go over here to line 4, 450 and on. And let's set up our graphics screen. Now, the way you set up graphics on the Atari in BASIC is you normally would do a graphics statement, graphics, and then the graphics mode number. So graphics 0, graphics 1, graphics 2, and so on. Um, in assembly language, it's a little more involved because we're actually going to be specifying the mode that we want. We're gonna be opening the device, which is the screen, and we, you know, what the Atari graphics command does for you, we have to do ourselves, all right? So the first thing we need to do is we need to determine the graphics mode that we're gonna use, and in this case, we're using graphics mode five. So I'm gonna load the accumulator with the number five. I'm also gonna add the number 16 to it because as you know in basic, if you do graphics five, you end up with graphics mode five with a text window at the bottom, three lines or four lines of text. And the way you remove that text window and tell the Atari you're gonna use the full screen is by adding 16. So we're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna load into accumulator five plus 16, which is 21. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push that onto the stack temporarily because I need to close the screen and open the screen before I actually go into the graphics mode. So we're gonna PHA, push that value 21 onto the stack, we'll need it later. And immediately I'm gonna load the X register with six zero. If you remember back from the tutorial on the input output blocks, uh, the first input output control block on the Atari starts at memory location three, four, zero. And the way that we access subsequent uh, input output control block input output control blocks is we add 10 or 12 hex to each one or I'm sorry 10 hex to each one of the um, uh, the base address 340 to get to input output control block one two three and so on so I'm loading the accumulator with 60 
that's going to give me access to input output control block six, which by the way, input output control block six is designed specifically to interact with the screen. So we're going to load six zero uh, as an offset. And then we're going to load into the accumulator the command close, which we've defined higher up, which I believe is a 12. And then we're going to store that value into the input output control command um, and get it ready to actually close the screen. So this X here is referencing the sixth control block and we have the, the close command um, in the accumulator. So that's actually being stored into input output control block number six. And then we're going to do a JSR J, uh, jump subroutine to the central input output vector and that's going to actually close the screen for us. We always want to close the screen before we try and open the screen. Okay, so then we're going to go down to line 540 and we're going to again load the X register with 6 0. But this time we're going to load the accumulator with the open command, meaning that we want to open the screen uh, so we can use it. So we're going to go ahead and store that open command into the input output control block like we did before, indexed by input output control block number six. Now we need to load some additional parameters into the input output control block. More specifically, we need to tell the input output control block what um, the buffer we're going to be using to read or write. In this case, it's going to be the screen device. Now, as you saw earlier, we defined S name as our S colon. So what we're going to do is we're going to load into the accumulator the low byte of S name, and we're going to store that into the IC BAL, which it stands for input control block um, address low byte. And then we're going to load the accumulator with the high byte of S name, and we're going to store that into ICBAH high byte, which is the um, using the X index register, which also tells it to use the input output control block six. So we're loading 60, um, which is control block six. We tell it we want to open, and what we want to open is the screen. We're going to pull back off the accumulator the value we stored earlier which was our graphics mode. So now our accumulator is gonna have that five plus 16, which is 21. Now there's a little magic you have to perform here in assembly language to actually get the graphics mode bits um, set just right. You need to do an AND F0 to isolate the four bytes of that um, byte and then we need to flip the high bit using the exclusive or number 10. And then we're going to um, or, a, or, a, or a it with an, a C to set it to read or write. Now that was a lot I said there in those three lines. But basically, if you look at the input output control specification when you're reading and writing to the screen, um, there are certain bits that have to be set so that the um, input output control block knows if you're reading or just reading to the screen or if you want to read and write to the screen and also whether or not that text window is going to show up at the bottom. So you have to do these three steps in order to get that. Um, I, I forgot to mention that um, that first graphics value here in line 20 needs to be stored in the IC aux 2. That's the input control block auxiliary byte um, number two, you have to store the graphics mode in that particular uh, byte first. Then you can do these operations here, which set the bits properly, which are ultimately stored in the I, uh, input output control block auxiliary byte number one. Let's look at that one more time. Uh, let's see, what did it start at? 500? Yeah, close enough. So let's look at it real quick again, if I can fit this all on the screen. We're loading uh, a 60 into the X register, which tells us we're working with input control block six. We are loading the close command. We are storing that close command. We are executing that close command. That closes the screen. We are then opening the screen with the open command. We are specifying in the buffer address that we're using the screen device. We're, we are then storing into IC aux 2 the graphics mode we want to change to, 
And then in aux one, we're setting bits that need to be set in order for the screen to appear properly the way we want it to look, clear and without a text window. So now you're going to jump to line 670, which is a jump to subroutine CIOV, and that's actually gonna put us in the graphics mode five with a black screen, with a clear screen, no text window, ready to go. All right, so the next thing we need to do starting at line 690 is this is where we need to set some uh, player missile graphics um, uh, locations. We need to set some memory locations. As we did in the base example, we poked certain values into certain memory addresses. Well, we're doing the same thing here, basically. We need to tell the um, player missile graphics that we're working with double line resolution, uh, as we did in the Atari basic example. So we're going to load the accumulator with 46, which means double line resolution, and we're storing that into location 559. Now, starting at 740, we need to do what we call clearing out the Oops, excuse me, got that off the screen. We need to clear out that memory, that memory block, where we're gonna be doing the player missile graphics. And the way we did in, that base, in the basic was we started the first memory address of that memory block, and we went to the end of the memory address of that memory block, and we just poked zeros. And it was very slow. And we actually had to write a, an assembly language routine to clear that memory out quickly for us. Well, here is that basic same routine that we have in assembly language where Basically, using two index registers, Y and X, um, the Y is going to be the overall index counter um, that we're using to clear out 256 bytes at a time. And the X register is the number of pages that we want to clear. And the accumulator be being zero is what we're actually going to be putting into those memory locations. And basically what we're doing here is we're doing a loop that decrements Y, Y starts at zero, we decrement it right away, which takes it to 255. And we're gonna basically loop through here 255 times uh, as we store a zero into the PM base, which is our base address and our Y index. So our PM base is a memory location in memory and Y is gonna start at 255, so we're gonna go 255, 254, 253, 252, 251 for that first bank or, or block of memory, bank of memory, excuse me, page of memory, and we're gonna clear 256 bytes. And once we get the counter um, back to uh, zero, then we're gonna decrement our X value, which is our page value, four pages, to three. We're gonna clear another page of memory we're gonna decrement X to two, clear another page of memory, and so on, until we've cleared the four pages of memory that represents our player missile graphics um, block of memory. All right, so that's what this area right here is doing, the clear out the PM area of RAM, okay? So let's see where we are moving to next. Okay. So here at line 900 is where we're actually going to create the bitmap data uh, for our spaceship, our player zero. So the label create player here, we're loading the accumulator with the PM base uh, plus one. We're clearing the carry flag because we're gonna do an addition operation here. And I'm gonna add two pages of memory to that accumulator because we know that in double line resolution player missile graphics, Player zero starts at, and I have it commented right here, the player missile base plus 512. Um, if you remember, that first part of the PM graphics is uh, unused. Um, that first, I think it's 712 bytes, and then we've got the additional 384 bytes on top of that, which is the missiles. And then player zero starts at 512 beyond the player missile base, um, wherever that player missile base is. And this is double line resolution. If it were single line resolution, it would be uh, 1K, 1024 bytes above the PM base. But in our example, this example, we're using double line resolution. So we're gonna load the base and we're gonna add two pages to it. And we are gonna store into the accumulator um, the Y location, which is the starting location in the 256 bytes high of player zero. Um, where we're gonna actually start storing his data, 
Okay, I hope that makes sense to everybody. <laughs> that was a lot to say there. But you have to understand that we're creating the player in memory and we're referencing the PM base plus 512 and then we're gonna, we're gonna basically get the player missile uh, data for player zero and we're gonna store it into that location, uh, the Y location, um, you know, where that, per where that player is. So basically what we're doing here is we're storing the Y location plus one, the high byte or of the Y location. We're loading 90, which is gonna be, if you think of the up and down vertical strip of the, you have 256 bytes you can use. We're gonna go 90 bytes down or 90 lines down, and that's where the spaceship's gonna start. So that's why I've loaded a 90 here into the accumulator and stored that into the low byte of Y location. So basically line 960 through 980 is saying that the Y location is gonna start right here in memory for player zero. So let's look at line 1000. And this is where we're actually going to insert the bitmap data for that player. So we're gonna load the accumulator uh, with player zero comma Y. Now player, if you remember back, is the, the the, what's the word I'm looking for, the equate that we use to store the bitmap data, okay? So we're saying is uh, load the first byte of the player and we're gonna store that into the Y location in memory indexed by Y um, with that actual player data. And I think I need to back up one more line here because I missed, I missed where we loaded the zero. So let's list 990 comma, yeah. So we load Y with zero, which is a counter. We load the first byte of the player data from our byte stream. Um, and we store that into the first location in memory where player zero is going to exist. We increment the Y by one. We compare it to eight. Have we read eight bytes yet of the player? Because we know our player is eight bytes in height. If not, we're gonna branch back to the insert player. We're gonna read the next byte and then we're gonna start that into the Y location. So we're basically doing a little eight time loop here, read the player data and place that into the um, player missile graphics area of memory where our player is gonna start. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna load the accumulator here with an initial value of 120 and we're gonna use this as the starting X position for our player. So now we've got our player in the Y. Now we're gonna set him in the X and we're gonna load that with 120, which is halfway of the screen. And we're gonna store that into the eighth position P0, which if you remember is the player missile graphics memory location where we, move, we use to read or write the X position of player zero. This was very similar to the poke we did in basic where we were poking the horizontal position of player zero. Um, this is how we do it here. And then obviously we're gonna store that into our tracking memory location, X location, so that as we later on move the joystick around, we always know where the player is in memory and where we need to move them. So now let's go to line 1090. And 1090 does nothing more but give a color to player zero. And the way we do that is we load a 68 in the accumulator, which is red and we store that into location 704, which is the color control register for player zero. And last but not least, we need to do as we did in basic, we need to enable the player missile graphics subsystem by poking a three or loading a three into location 53277. So now we've got our screen open, we've got our player missile graphics addressing setup. We've got the memory cleared. We've loaded the player bitmap data and we've set some attributes such as the X position, the color, and we've enabled the player missile graphics. Great. So at this point, we're about ready to enter our main loop. And if, if everything was in a perfect world, we would have a black screen with a spaceship in the middle. So let's move on. Now we're going to go into what we call the main loop. Now the main loop is going to do nothing more than read the joystick, determine if the left and right um, stick is being activated, and then move the player zero accordingly. 
So let's look at line 1130 on, and I have it labeled here obviously as our main loop. Now, let me see if I can get that a little better. I don't like to get too much off the screen, so we miss it. So we've got a main um, label here. And obviously you would think one of the things we would need to do in our main loop is we need to read the joystick, correct? We need to know if the user is, you know, mashing the joystick left or right or up and down in other cases. And I actually have some up and down coding, but I'll show you that after we, we finish the left and right. But we want to know if the user is hitting the joystick left or right. So we have a subroutine called RDSTK, read stick. And basically I jump to that subroutine right away and I read the joystick. Now, if you'll notice down here, you can see the, the subroutine read stick right here. And what it's doing is it's loading the accumulator with the value of stick zero. Stick zero, as you know, is the memory location in the Atari where we can read the value of the joystick zero. So let's go ahead and get back to that routine. So what we're doing right here is we're loading the value of stick zero. And I'm gonna skip the code here that actually determines whether or not the user is going up and down on the joystick. We'll talk about that after. Let's focus more on the side to side, which again, we load the stick zero. This gives us a value in the accumulator that we will and with the number four. By anding this with the number four, we're basically isolating the bits that are going to give us the value of whether or not a zero or a one will determine if the user is pressing the left stick. So we can do a branch if equal, they're going left, to the label we have left. We load the stick value again. This time we and it with a number eight, and that allows us to branch if it's equal to right over to our label called right. And then we're gonna to return to subroutine, which is gonna take us back up to the main loop where we are called again to read the joystick. So basically we're reading joystick, determining left or right, up or down, making the appropriate changes and going right back to the loop. It's a very simple loop for this program. And so let's take a look a little bit further down to see what's actually happening when you hit the joystick left or right. Again, we're gonna skip the up label, we're gonna skip the down label, and we're gonna go right to the left. And let's look at left and right. So basically left is doing something very simple, line seven, 1770. Um, left is the label, line 1780 says, load the accumulator with X lock. X lock is, for all intents and purposes, a variable or memory location that we are always storing the last known X location of our player. So when we initially placed the player on the screen at location 120, when we initialized this program, we stored 120 in the X location. So that's where player zero is starting from. So we're gonna load that value. We're gonna compare it to 39, which happens to be the left extreme minimum that I'm allowing for this particular program. And we're saying if, if it is equal to that minimum, then we're gonna branch out to skip left, which basically does nothing but return from the subroutine. So it does nothing. Otherwise, if it's not 39, we're gonna decrement X location by one. And then we're gonna store that value into the horizontal position, player zero's memory location. So we read the joystick, we determine left or right, we go to the left, for example, we load our location, we compare it if it's to a minimum or maximum value, and we decrement it and update it. It's that simple, guys. So now we go down here to, if they would have hit the joystick to the right, like I showed you before, we load the accumulator with their current location, we compare it to 208, which is the rightmost extreme, extremity that I'm not allowing them to go past, and we either skip it or we increment that location. Um, we load it into the accumulator and then we store it into their current position and then we return. Very, very simple. So 
Let's assemble. By the way, I found a trick that will allow you guys to assemble the code in like seconds compared to watching all of this listing go by as it's actually compiling the code and giving you the, the memory locations. What you can do is you can type ASM comma pound sign dash and that will basically, as you can see, it assembled the entire code in about two seconds or less. It doesn't, it turns off the listing, uh, which then of course speeds it up by whatever, 10,000 fold. So here's our spaceship, left, right, left, right. Easy peasy. Now, he's not responding to up and down right now because I have that code remarked out, but let's go back into the, the assembly listing and let's take a look at what the up and down routine does. So if we enable the code to go up, what we're basically doing is we're saying here at 1450, load the Y register with number one, which means we're going to move this guy one byte at a time. We decrement the current Y location because wherever the player is now, we want him to be one location up. So what we're doing is we're loading the accumulator of where they are now, memory-wise. We decrement it, and then we store it one up. And then we increment Y twice. We compare it to the number 10, which allows us to know if we've moved the correct number of bytes or not. And we, re we basically loop back if we need to continue moving that player up. Now, the same thing kind of happens for the down motion, and that is we need to load, move the top byte first, so we're gonna load number seven. We load the um, Y location, the current number seven byte into the accumulator. We increase it one because we're moving him down, obviously, and then we store it in the new location. We decrement Y twice because we need to get back to the seventh byte and then go back one more to go to six. Move it, go back two, five, move it, go back two, and so on. And basically this will move the player down in memory one byte. So why don't we go ahead and uncomment the code that determines if the joystick is pressing up or down. And that is right here, line 1280. Let's get rid of that comment, that comment, that comment, that comment, and that comment. Let's do a quick assemble, go into the debugger, execute our code, and now we've got left and right, up and down motion. See how fast it is? And you even have diagonal motion because assembly language is so fast, it can, it can read the change of the joystick almost, almost instantly. So we could create, you know, almost like a centipede type of game where the little centipede or the worm, whatever the thing is that eats, the, sh <coughs> shoots the little pellets can go in any direction pretty much. But you can see the speed here. Oh, there's one thing I didn't show you, which was the delay in the code. So let's go back to the code. I think it was uh, around the same line numbers that we have the, the main, okay, here it is. Okay, so in the main loop, we've got jump sub subroutine to joystick, or read joystick, and that basically handles all our movement. But once we come back from that routine, we're loading the X register with five, we're loading the Y register with zero, and this delay here is basically just a loop that goes through five times um, to just slow things down just a bit. We decrement it here, we branch if not equal to zero to delay, um, and then we, we do um, that'll that basically that'll go 255 to zero, and then here the X we're going to decrement to um, four, and then we're going to go back to later. So we're going to do five loops of 256, which just happens to be enough time to be able to move that spaceship around the way we want to. Now, if we wanted to increase the delay here a little bit, we could do 10 ASM. And you can see how much slower we're moving now. See the difference? So if you needed to slow your player down a bit, you could actually play around with the delay and get it to move a little slower. All right? But any of it. 
So there we go, guys. Um, sprites in assembly language. Um, this is our first, uh, uh, a first step, if you will, into writing our game into assembly language. Um, the next episode, we're going to get into creating like some lines in the background, or maybe create some enemies on a top line um, that are going to be static. We're not going to get into movement of enemies yet, or any any of that AI. That's a little bit more advanced. That's down the road. But I'd like to get the next one going, where we can actually have one or two opponents, or or uh, I'm sorry, invaders or aliens on the screen, and then we can start mashing the fire button on our joystick and fire a missile upwards like we did in basic towards those other players and detect some collision all right so i'm working on that and i should have that done shortly and we'll, we'll get moving on that as well i also have some good videos coming up on display list and graphics and how to change graphic modes and the colors it all ties together with what we're trying to do ultimately which is to write a small game in assembly language so anyway that being said Give me some comments. Let me know if you like what's going on. Please subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button. I need the likes. And um, we'll see you in the next video. And Happy New Year.